Hello, good evening. Welcome to News at 10 live from the News Hub at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. We're also live on 3FM 92.7 and streaming live on our Facebook page and on 3news.com. I'm Stephen Enti. Let's start with the major news highlights of the day. been confirmed dead and 10 suspects arrested following the bloody clashes at Kintampo in the Bono East region on Tuesday, April 16. Two others who sustain injuries are responding to treatment at the Holy Family Hospital in Techima. And the Bureau of National Investigations has recovered 6.5 million CDs from ghost names on the payroll of the National Service Scheme. Executive Director of the Scheme, Mustafa Yusif, appearing before the Public Accounts Committee says the money has been deposited in the BNI accounts instead of government chests. And former Peruvian President Alan Garcia has died after shooting himself as police arrived at his home to arrest him over bribery allegations. He was accused of taking bribes from Brazilian construction company Odebrecht. Claims he denied. Garcia was rushed to hospital in the capital, Lima. Those are our major news highlights. Remember, you can hear us live on 3FM 92.7 and we're streaming on our Facebook page and on 3news.com. Up next is a big one. Welcome back. Now, the Architectural Engineering Services uh, Limited, AESL con consultants for the controversial Vice President's Bangalore, are yet to be paid for their work on the $13 million multi-purpose building. AESL is, however, advising government to resume construction of the project. Work on official residence of the Vice President stalled following a controversy between the coup for the led administration and officials of the previous regime on the cost of the project. Contractors of the project concert have been paid some seven million dollars after series of variations. The late former vice president Kwesi Misa Arthur raised queries on the variations with the Architectural Engineering Services Limited, the project consultant, further causing an audit into the project. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia in 2017 expressed shock at the cost of the project. As at now, it still remains suspended and no work is going on now. We probably waiting for the government to take a decision as to the final use that the project is going to be put to. But it is imagined, however, that the AESL were not the initial consultant to the project. From day one, it was um, national security that brought in AESL to advise on certain aspects. The project was started by a different consultant firm, but when the next government came, they came to AESL and we picked it from what the initial consultants had done. AESL has not been paid for. We did make a submission and we were to negotiate the fee level with national security. But by virtue of the agency, the project was going on pending the conclusion of our fee charges and therefore payment. So as we sit today, we have not been paid anything. The acting director of the AESL, Robert Abugri, says the project must be completed. The state asset now, even though it's not completed, yeah. it needs to be completed and put to use. The chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, James Kluche Aveji, says the government must make a determination on the progress of the project. The government should take decision so that the, ha the, the house can be completed. Whether it should be used by the vice president, whether it should be used by whoever, the project must be completed and put to use. That is all that I'm saying. If it is there, no decision is taken on it. It was still, yeah. and it's probably fun. Right, so let's get on to Skype. Uh, Vice President of Imani Africa, uh, Salom Brante, is joining us. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you extremely for your time. 
Thank you very much for having me. So the argument many people are making is that uh, this uh, construction of the bungalow in the first place was unnecessary, and now we're having to deal with the fact that it's lying waste after constructions have begun. AESL is owed some amount of money in this whole back and forth deal. Uh, where do we stand in this, really? Um, I would say this is a manifestation of um, uh, what I would call procurement uh, as a scam or the kind of uh, machinations that a lot of governments do, uh, especially in, within, within this fourth uh, Republican period, where they, they drum up certain projects as landmark projects and uh, they only use it to skim off money off the top. And uh, unfortunately, the office of the vice president, um, as an office, not as part of any government, has been dragged into this kind of mess where uh, you are having all these procurement issues coming up just because uh, there was lack of prudence in, in thinking through some of these things. Um, it is my personal belief that uh, when it comes to edifices of a national nature, there should be something like a very clear and open plan that everybody has discussed instead of some of these arbitrary moves that only uh, end up becoming uh, albatrosses around the neck of taxpayers because uh, a lot of the monies that are allocated for this could have been used for far better uses especially when you think about uh, the kind of deficit that we have in other areas it is sad to see that uh, this uh, uh, residence of the vice president has become embroiled in such a scandal. And I believe it is just because of the fact that uh, successive governments have been trying to identify projects that they can sort of capitalize and gain from uh, through the procurement process, only to line their pockets uh, down the line. And this lack of continuity from one government to another clearly epitomizes this kind of situation. And so, it, it's, for me, it is a very sad uh, chain of events that has led to this. And I, I do not see any end in sight in terms of uh, what, the, what the solution is. Mm, I know you are saying that uh, you don't see any end in sight, but we have to figure out how to resolve this. So from where you sit and, and, and making the argument that this was un unnecessary in the first place and uh, uh, unduly dragged the vice presidency into all this uh, mess, how do we resolve it? One, to continue the construction and pay off AESL or, as usual, continue to wait so that uh, the relevant authorities continue with their so-called investigations into the cost components? First of all, it has taken two years, I mean, for us to have ample time to really look into the costing and the, the, the quantities of the, uh, the, the previous administration's um, estimation of this project to know whether it is prudent or not. We still haven't had any report to that uh, effect. We, we don't have anything published. The whole thing, there is no transparency. The best way forward is to have transparency. Once we have some kind of transparency around what the project is supposed to do what it's supposed to achieve and what the benchmarks are or the milestones are. Then we can then begin to get some consensus around it. If we have to call, uh, there are a lot of local experts who have done construction in this country. I don't think this is beyond the scope of any local private company or even the AESL itself. Let us be transparent about all of these things and find a, a lasting solution. If it means that we have to decommission those who are already on site, then we decommission those on site because we know that they have overestimated the cost of this project. If it means them continuing with it, the transparency is the solution to the whole uh, issue at stake right now. You, you brought in a very interesting dimension to the discussion by suggesting that as a nation we should have a plan whether long term or short term in uh, constructing or deciding on whether to put up specific edifices here or there. But how will such a plan work? I think it's a very simple thing. Um, we we are all we know as a nation what our prime uh, targets in terms of real estate or government level real estate is. We'll need maybe a state house. We'll need a presidential villa. We'll need a bunch of presidential villas across the country. We'll need guest houses. We'll need official residences for certain specific um, offices of of, of state. Uh, some being the chief justice's uh, uh, residence. Some being the speaker of parliament's residence. Um, certain major national institutions, as well as the office of the vice president. It is very clear and evident, therefore, that 
This is not something that should be in the mandate of a party in power. It should be clearly in the mandate of a specific group or a specific institution that handles national infrastructure or infrastructure that is related to national security interests. And that specific group should have full mandate, regardless of which government in power, to execute and discharge uh, or, or erect or implement these facilities with some level of transparency, with some level of national consensus, with the tacit uh, agreement of quite a lot, of, a lot of players in the construction industry. I don't think this is far-fetched. This is a nation with so many experts in this, these fields. This is a nation where we can gather all these kinds of people into that particular committee where they will vet these projects, prioritize them, and then allocate money for these projects. It shouldn't be in the purview of one party or another because then the, 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 it becomes very discreet and nobody gains anything from it, especially if you look at the kind of culture of maintenance we have as a nation. Then you will see that we are really lacking in terms of how to even keep our national, uh, what do you call it, uh, real estate or our national buildings of repute or importance. Mm -hmm. That poor maintenance of, uh, what, uh, what do you call it, uh, maintenance of culture uh, or cultural maintenance activity is reflecting a lot of our national buildings where even sometimes even in front of the presidents you see we uh, what do you call it lawns so it is very clear that we need to do much more and be far more organized in running these things than we are now these ad hoc measures are only shortcuts that are bringing us million dollar failures which are catastrophic in nature and do not show that we are serious and we are, we are working in the right direction. Well, I know we're discussing the vice president's bungalow and all of that, but uh, gauging from uh, the discussions that began from yesterday, the Saglemi uh, affordable housing project, and the fact that it's been deteriorating, uh, having been sitting there for like two years. So uh, this transparency and, and then consensus you're talking about and the national plan you're talking about, would this be applicable in in this whole back and forth of national housing, national affordable housing so, projects? So, 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 so for me, the area of even these housing projects is one that the government should not even bother handling. Again, we see a litany of mistakes right from the, uh, the first of such things uh, that were planned, like the STX, uh, and then, uh, what do you call it, the one during Kufo's time, uh, former President Kufo's time, I've forgotten the name. Uh, there are so many of them scattered in the bush, poorly planned, poorly designed, poorly implemented, and they are, uh, the buildings that millions of uh, dollars were taken from in terms of loans and other facilities have become dwelling places. I mean, these are luxury apartments for rats and lizards, if you put it that way. And this is a very sad story for a nation with such a huge housing deficit, especially in the urban areas. And this is a very clear testimony that the government has very little in terms of man, uh, what do you call it, acumen or ability to handle these housing estates. On the other hand, if you check the private sector, you'd realize that there are the likes of the Regimonals, the Manets, um, the, the Rehoboth Estates, etc., who have successfully built and deployed quite a lot of these uh, buildings or quite a lot of apartments or real estate property for which people are patronizing through so many different uh, interventions financially. This shows that the private sector has a model that works. What the private sector needs at this point is an infusion of capital that can allow them to actually even produce some of these things at far more affordable prices for which the, uh, the people, I mean, general people can accept. <laughs> the fact that we are making this a political thing where everyone wants to take a box in a manifesto where they say they were providing affordable housing, which case is not even affordable anyway, yeah. horribly de uh, developed, horribly designed, poorly implemented. This is not the way to go. It has just become a, a, a sinkhole where corrupt politicians are using to draw in public funds where they know that uh, after a certain while it will be forgotten and then they skim the monies off the top. These things are failures. They are grand failures of our state, of, uh, of, of our state, or Ghana as it is. And these things, it's high time that we understood or we stopped all of these things. Because once the government is able to even get funding for these, and it is given to people, players, real players in the real estate sector, we are going to create more jobs, create more expertise in the area, and actually create more avenues for which private real estate players will be able to 
add more value to the economy than the government is doing. Because instead of the government adding more value to the economy through these housing, set, uh, what do you call it, uh, in interventions, they're actually taking more from the economy and putting it into uh, hands that are not productive, which means that these monies are basically being siphoned out of the economy for no uh, for no use or for no benefit to for the no state. Benefit. At this point, what they are doing is actually a negative benefit to the state or what, rather incurring cost to the state. Right, uh, Salam Brante, we're grateful for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Salam Brante is uh, Vice President of Imani Africa. I'm Stephen Enti. This is News at 10. You can hear us live on 3FM 92.7 as well. You can catch us on your DSTV channel 279. I'm told start times uh, 503 also. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Now, uh, news just coming in. Uh, the Ministry of Aviation has denied uh, reports that it's uh, uh, privatizing the operations of the Kutuka International Airport in a release uh, from the Public Affairs Unit of the Aviation Ministry, which just came. Uh, it says that the ministry has taken note that the Initial internal considerations of a possible management module for the Kotoka International Airport to enhance its value, performance and international competitiveness has been leaked and misconstrued to the general public as a plan by the government of Ghana to privatize or sell the Kotoka International Airport. For the avoidance of doubt, the Ministry of Aviation wishes to inform the public as follows, that the ministry has no plans whatsoever to recommend, neither does the government of Ghana have plans to approve a privatization sale of the Kotoka International Airport. And cabinet has not been requested, neither has the Ministry of Aviation submitted a cabinet memorandum re recommending approval for the privatization or sale of the Kotoka International Airport. There are five points of um, explanations, uh, detailed explanations there. But the ministry, the statement ends by saying the ministry wishes to reiterate that the best practices for the management of the industry will be the focus of all its decisions and actions at all times. Uh, so. That's news just coming in from the Aviation Ministry. Uh, let's uh, move on now. The chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, NCC, Joycelyn Nkrumah, has revealed her outfit was never consulted in the drafting of the Vigilante Bill, which is currently before Parliament. This was after her outfit had uh, championed its enactments. Let's uh, take a listen. Before the House rose, one of the issues that came up for discussion, which eventually could become a law, is the issue of the vigilante bill that was brought to the House. Have you uh, had any input into the bill? No, we did not have an input into the bill. So the bill came to the House of Parliament and that is where we all were informed that there was a bill. But we must, we must also realize that when the president um, issued his directive to the two parties at his State of the Nations address, he indicated that if they didn't mm -hmm. find time to meet within a week, he was going to legislate on the matter. So really and truly, that was what the president had, had ordered and he had given an alternative. You, you meet or I legislate and they didn't meet so the bill is before Parliament NCC did not have um, any input in the bill but we also conducted a lot of stakeholder engagement and I think about a week and a half ago we actually um, launched our, our report that really spells out the 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 role the the views of the various stakeholders in this matter for to them what are the factors that have contributed to vigilantism what are the adverse effects on society and going forward what kind of um, solutions we can come to in to to up, you know to uproot the scourge of vigilantism and that report is is available um, I know that as we speak Parliament has invited the public to issue memoranda on the bill and um, NCC as we said we have that uh, our report 
on our website, nccegh.org. So it's available for anybody to use, particularly for us to find a more broad-based approach to resolving the scourge of vigilantism. Because the, the law is one aspect of it, but there are underlying root causes that we must um, address in order to find a lasting resolution to this. And the Bureau of National Investigations, BNI, has received some 6.5 million Ghana cities from ghost names on the payroll of the National Service Scheme. Executive Director of the scheme, Mustafa Yusif, appearing before the Public Accounts Committee says the money has been deposited in BNI accounts instead of government chests. Some eight former directors of the scheme had to appear before the court over the matter. Subsequently, the Bureau of National Investigation has been investigating circumstances leading to the monies belonging to the scheme being paid to names that never existed. The Auditor General in its 2016 report said that a review of a sampled bank statement made available to them from the districts and the regions indicated that without authority from the management of the NSS, monies were transferred into BNI account. At that time, we had a special case, and that special case was the ghost name scam that hit the scheme at the time. Most, and the investigative body that was signed by government to investigate that particular issue was the BNI. BNI, in their operations, then decided to create a special account, and that special account was to collect money that was uh, allegedly uh, taken from service personnel allowance account by the district officers and also regional officers and national officers who were implicated. Executive Director of the National Service Key, Mustafa Yusuf, justified the transfers. We've written and the BNI responded that because the case is still pending in court, they are using the money as an exhibit until the case is, judgment is made on the case. BNI is unable to release the money back. The Auditor General was emphatic on how the money must be recovered. On the scheme's farms, the Auditor General revealed that with the exception of a power farm in the Greater Accra region, all the regional farms have collapsed with machines and other equipment left under the mercy of the weather. And one person has been confirmed dead and 10 suspects and 10 suspects uh, arrested following the bloody crisis at the Kintampo in the Buno East region on Tuesday, uh, 16th April. Two others uh, who sustained injuries are responding to treatment at the Holy Family Hospital in Tichimai. Two groups, Dega Land Association and the Mo Youth Association, attacked some workers at the Kintampo Waterfalls, claiming the land belonged to them and demanded that all government officials working there should vacate the facility. Police officers deployed to the area arrested six ringleaders. The youth groups later massed up at the police station in protest against the arrests and demanded their release. They mounted roadblocks to disrupt traffic flow, compelling the deployment of a reinforcement team, including military personnel. In an attempt to remove the wooden logs used as roadblocks, one military personnel's hand was reportedly slashed by one of the protesters. As the security personnel tried to calm down the situation, the other protester tried to snatch a rifle from one of the police officers. The trigger went off in the process, killing one person in the crowd instantly. Four others involved in the chaos were later arrested upon a tip-off and will be arraigned together with the ringleaders on Thursday, April 18. And the governing New Patriotic Party has set May 18 to conduct an extraordinary delegates conference in the six new regions and special regional executive committee meetings in some uh, of the traditional regions. Uh, General Secretary John Buedu announcing that modalities for the conference entreated would-be candidates to respect the rules of engagement and exhibit a high sense of discipline. Here's a report by Gofrek Tanam. 
The decision to hold the extraordinary regional delegates conferences and special regional executive meetings has been necessitated by the party obligation to fill vacant regional executive positions occasioned by the recent regional reorganization. The extraordinary conferences will be held in the newly created regions comprising OT, Western North, Bono East, Ahafo, Savannah and Northeast regions. The term of office of the officers shall be contaminous with all regional executives. We are doing the election in 2019. The term of office of all other regional executives in all the regions will be ending by 2022. So these officers to be elected will also, uh, their term of office will also end in 2022. The Special Regional Executive Committee meetings will be held under the supervision of a national representative and shall come off from May 3 to 5 in Bono East, Northern, Western and Volta regions. Regional Executive Committee meeting shall be held in strict compliance with Article 924. The Regional Executive Committee will elect another officer of the party so, for instance, in the Regional Executive Committee, if there's a vacancy for secretary position, the Regional Executive Committee, when they meet, will elect another officer, maybe the treasurer or the woman organizer or the national coordinator or the youth organizer to become the secretary or the treasurer. The General Secretary of the party, John Buedu, cautioned delegates and aspirants to conduct themselves in the upcoming exercise. The party wishes to appeal to all stakeholders, especially the will-be candidates for the various positions in the Extraordinary Delegates Conference and their supporters to respect the rules of engagement and conduct this exercise with the necessary candor. Applicants who wish to contest will have to pay 1,000 cities for the chairperson position and 500 cities for other positions. Picking of nomination is on Tuesday, April 29 and 30. And that's our wrap up with News at 10. Thank you very much for your time. On behalf of the crew, good night. There's more news at 3news.com.